was working this summer in Dr. Richard Bierstra's lab in the Department of Genetics, uh, specifically working on plant genetics in Arabidopsis thaliana, and the role of the BTB E3 ubiquitin ligase family in Arabidopsis. So the first question I'd like to address today is why would we choose Arabidopsis thaliana as a model organism? And there are several reasons for that. The first one being that it has a really short generation time of just 60 days, so to go from one generation to the next doesn't take us very long. It's a very small and compact plant, and so it, uh, a lot of plants can be grown at the same time in a small area. It's self-pollinating, which saves us a lot of trouble when it comes to actually going from one generation to the next and generating seeds, because the plant just takes care of that by itself. And its genome has been sequenced. The genome was completed in 2000, and uh, since then it's, uh, it's been maintained and updated by the Arabidopsis information resource. <coughs> Now, uh, the system I'm working on is a system that is involved with proteolysis inside the cell. So what are the roles of proteolysis inside a cell? Uh, the, there are several reasons why a particular cell may want to degrade a protein. And uh, some of those reasons are that the protein may be incorrectly made, and so errors in the protein sequence itself. Or the protein may be misfolded, so incorrect folding, which will mean that it cannot perform its function. Or uh, the cell may need to regenerate amino acids for rerouting into other pathways for survival, and so it may reduce the supply of a particular protein. Or, uh, in certain cases, the cell would want to regulate the amounts of certain key proteins and regulatory enzymes, and uh, so proteolysis can be involved in regulation as well. In uh, regulation, particularly, it, uh, the cell usually tags the protein with a molecule such as ubiquitin, and uh, then marks it for degradation. Now, uh, ubiquitin is a 76 amino acid long reusable polypeptide tag that uh, is used by cells to direct selective protein removal, among other things. It is remarkably conserved throughout evolution, and it's only restrict it's restricted to eukaryotes and archaea. And uh, typically, when a cell is ubiquitated, uh, ubiquitated with a single molecule of ubiquitin, the mo the uh, Function of the protein is modified, but when a polyubiquitin chain is formed, the pro protein is usually marked down for degradation. Now, coming to the system which we are working on, it's the ubiquitin 26S proteasome system. And uh, this system is one of the major ways in which a cell regulates it, the amount of protein it has. So, in this uh, pathway, uh, uh, the first step is ubiquitization of an E1 enzyme, which is called the ubiquitin activating enzyme. So this is the only uh, step in the reaction which requires an ATP. So the, uh, the ubiquitin moiety first binds to an AMP, the ATP degrades to form an AMP. And then and, uh, it forms a thioester bond between the ubiquitin activating enzyme, the E1, <coughs> and the uh, ubiquitin molecule. Then the E1 transfers the ubiquitin to an E2, which is a ubiquitin conjugating enzyme. And uh, this uh, happens through a transesterification reaction. Uh, now the E2 is usually the protein which uh, transfers the ubiquitin to the target molecule. It usually does this with the help of an E3 enzyme, which is a ubiquitin ligase. And uh, the E3 usually serves along with uh, uh, two other proteins as a scaffold which brings the target and uh, the E2 close together so that the ubiquitin can be transferred. The specificity for this entire reaction is also provided by the E3. Now, once the uh, once a polyubiquitin chain is formed on a target which needs to be degraded by the cell, uh, the cell can either remove that ubiquitin chain by uh, <coughs> using deubiquitization enzymes, in which case the protein will not be degraded, or it can uh, send the target to a 26S proteasome which will then degrade the target and release the ubiquitin, which will then regenerate single ubiquitin molecules using deubiquitization enzymes. Now, uh, why are we concentrating on E3 ligases? Because um, in, if we analyze the number of genes which are present in the ubiquitin 26S proteasome system, we notice that the highest number of genes are the E3 genes, and these are the genes which provide specificity and selectivity to the pathway. And it accounts for nearly 5% of the entire proteome of Arabidopsis, which means that it is a critical pathway which is involved in a lot of selective, selective protein degradation. Now coming to the BTB family, which is a subfamily of the E3 ligases which we work on. It consists of about 80 genes, and it's essential for survival. This was discovered when 
This is a scaffold which is used by the E3, in this case the VTB, and the E2 to transfer ubiquitin to the target. So when uh, the VTB can only function when one of either one of two isoforms of CUL3 are present, CULIN 3A or CULIN 3B. And uh, when a double mutant was made with both CULINs knocked out, it was discovered that uh, none of the plants ever survived. So, and this led to the conclusion that the VTB uh, set of E3 ligases are critical for plant survival. Uh, phylogenic analysis of the BTB family is complete, which, uh, and there are several genes which are discovered which have similar suspected functions, but the real functions of most genes are still unknown. And this is the phylogenic analysis of the BTB family, and uh, this is the uh, basis for the study which we are doing in our lab right now, which <coughs> involves creating mutants or double mutants of uh, certain BTB genes, especially related ones. So the uh, Genes for which we have made mutants, double mutants, are indicated at the bottom with these uh, U-shaped marks. And uh, on the basis of this, we expect to see phenotypes depending on whether, the, whether how critical that particular gene is for the cell and its development. Now, another question I'd like to address is how Arabidopsis thaliana is mutated. So, the mutation is done using a particular bacterium called Agrobacterium tumefaciens, which has a plasmid in it called the TI plasmid or the tumor-inducing plasmid. So when a, cell, a plant is infected with agrobacterium, the TI plasmid has the property to transfer a small part of its DNA into the plant genome and it integrates in a random place in the plant genome. The DNA which does integrate is called the tDNA or transfer DNA. And uh, once it has integrated, uh, we can just sequence the tDNA and, uh, uh, and some other region beyond it in the genome to find out where it has integrated in the genome. And, Depending on whether it has knocked out our gene of interest, we can use that mutant for further study. So the first objective was of my work was to characterize an interesting double mutant phenotype that was uh, discovered in the lab earlier. It showed a pin-like phenotype, which is clearly observable here, and it also never showed more than a single cotyledon uh, while it was being grown. So this is a wild-type plant, which is grown for the same time as this, and this shows two cotyledons and two true leaves, whereas this just shows a single cotyledon and isn't growing very well at all. So to characterize this, the first step that we thought was appropriate was to genotype the uh, plants that showed that phenotype to see whether the double mutant genotype is actually present and whether that is that might be what is causing the phenotype. So for this, we set up a PCR reaction in which um, we use three primers. So the left and right primer together were used to amplify a small part of the gene itself. So this is the left primer and the right primer. And we set it up so that this, the, this region of the gene is about 1.2 kilobases in length. At the same time, we use a third primer, which is called the left border primer, which binds to one end of the tDNA. So in case the tDNA is present in, that in, in, the, in the genome, then uh, this, the, instead of the larger product, only the uh, shorter product will form which is about 700 bases in length. And uh, depending on which product we see in the, uh, in the gel after the PCR, we can conclude which genotype is present. So when we did genotype this, um, what we saw was that for a, um, when a, the a DNA from a wild type plant was used, we saw the expected wild type length, which is around 1.2 kilobases. Then when DNA from a mutant, from a mutant in the other locus, is uh, used, we again see wild type length in the locus for which we are genotyping right now. When DNA from the mutant in the locus which we are genotyping for was done, we uh, see bands at 700 bases, which is again the expected length. But then when we uh, ran DNA from our suspected mutants, uh, which we expect have a double mutant genotype, so we should expect mutants at, we should see a mutant band at this location. Uh, we see a wild type band instead. We, we see only a wild type band. We should typically see only this band because that's the genotype we were expecting, a homozygous mutant genotype, but instead we see only a, only a wild type genotype which indicates that the interesting pin-like phenotype we saw was not because of the double mutant genotype. And this led us to conclude that there may be an extra transfer DNA insertion somewhere else in the genome. And uh, one of the ways to find that out is tail PCR. So um, since that didn't work out, we decided to screen for phenotypes in the F2 generation of 
crosses between phylogenetically related BTB gene pairs in that the phylogenetic tree I had shown you earlier, we picked out closely related genes from that, made double mutants, and uh, in the F2 generation of those, we expected segregation. And in, in, plant, in plants from the F2 generation, we looked for some interesting phenotypes. So some of the ways in which we did look for phenotypes are, um, these are the cotyledons uh, of a, this is a wild type seedling, of which these are the cotyledons. So we look for differences in cotyledon size, number, or the angle at which the cotyledons open, or their pigmentation. We looked at, um, uh, this is the hypocotyl. So we looked at differences in hypocotyl length or thickness. And this is the root of the seedling. We looked uh, for differences in root length or even presence or absence of a root. So the method followed for the screen was in each cross we, uh, we plated out more than 50 seeds and uh, looked for phenotypes that were showed by multiple plants. Multiple because we expected a Mendelian segregation ratio of about 1 is to 16 in the F2 generation. And then uh, for the suspected mutants that we picked out, we genotyped them and a few uh, siblings which showed the wild type phenotype and the result we expected was that the suspected mutants should be homozygous for the two mutant alleles and siblings should segregate again. So from the screen the results were that uh, uh, we, when we genotyped each cross uh, with the two individual loci, in some cases we found plants which are heterozygous in both loci which again showed us that the, phen the phenotype we saw was not because of our mutant genotype. In some plants we found that one of the loci just gave us wild type bands and there was not even a single heterozygote there which tells us that the phenotype was probably because of natural variation from wild type and that the cross that was done earlier did not work. A few of the crosses that we picked out we had to not pursue because they've already been characterized by other labs. And in some cases we found plants which are homozygous for one locus and heterozygous for the other which means that when they segregate in the next generation, they should give us a 50% double homozygous mutant phenotype, which is what we are looking for because that's what we expect will show us the phenotype. Another reason why we could not have picked out certain phenotypes in this case is because several phenotypes are very subtle and we could only pick out very obvious phenotypes. So if you notice here, most of our phenotypes are smaller in size. However, there can be more subtle phenotypes which would be much more easily picked out in the next generation when we have 50% double homozygous mutants. Now, in uh, uh, the future direction for this objective is to follow the homozygous, for, follow the plants which are homozygous at one locus and heterozygous at the other, because they will segregate to give us 50% double homozygous mutants, and some crosses which did not segregate and gave us only wild types at one locus, uh, they need to be remade. In our lab, recently we found that one of the crosses in which we had found a plant which uh, was homohet and um, did segregate in the next generation when we planted the next generation out uh, in which we expected 50% double homozygous mutants. We saw a few very interesting phenotypes again which are uh, uh, the cotyledons that we uh, that I had shown you in the wild type seedling which would look like this typically. In these plants we see fused cotyledons. So the cotyledons haven't actually separated after they came out of the seedling and they show us either a spoon like or a cup like phenotype. So you can see the cup here as well. And in the same cross in one particular plant, we noticed that it had three cotyledons. And we still have to characterize this, so we will go ahead and characterize this in the lab. And uh, one more learning from that is that um, this phenotype that I, that I showed you right here is as interesting as the one we saw right in the beginning, the pin-like phenotype. But uh, we've learned through experience that we shouldn't get ahead of ourselves and uh, make sure that the genotyping is right and the genotype is causing the phenotype before we go ahead with anything else. In summary, we, we proved that the pin-like phenotype that was observed is not because of the expected double mutant genotype. And we discovered a few uh, homohead or doublehead plants that should segregate to give double mutants in the next generation. And, um, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Richard D. Vyastra, whose lab I worked in, and Dr. Matthew Christians, who was my mentor and guide and all the members of the VHR lab who made the summer a great experience for me and special thanks to the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India and UW Medicine for funding and organizing the Corona.